So without further ado, welcome everybody to my foot pain and plantar fasciitis workshop. Uh, the goal of the workshop is to show you some effective strategies for getting rid of your pain without, as the slide says, without injections, without medications, without surgeries. Hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll have some sense of what's going on with your shoulder, uh, your shoulder, with your foot. Obviously I've done other workshops. I do actually shoulder pain, low back pain and foot pain workshops. And some of these uh, things are very, very similar. But hopefully uh, we're here to show you a good, effective, conservative strategy and to have um, some sort of action plan by the time we're done with the workshop today for what to do about it going forward. Um, a lot of people are still, you know, this whole COVID thing, it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to end. Um, positive vibes, hope the, hopefully this vaccine thing will uh, get us over the hump here because this is just crazy. Um, we had um, about a month that we were off initially, and we did a lot of telehealth back then. We're not really doing a lot of telehealth now. Uh, I think I got done with my last person a couple weeks ago. So it's pretty much all 100% in-house. So for those of you that are still um, uncomfortable with coming in, we can certainly still do telehealth if that's something you want to you know, proceed with. Um, but if you do decide to come in, um, we are very compliant with everything. Everybody's washing their hands when they come in. Uh, we got you know people spaced out. We're trying to um, you know, we sanitize as much as we can in between every single patient, um, masks on the whole time. So just so um, you have some sense of peace of mind when you come in. So, um, but it is of course, workshops like this that help us to spread the word and to help people if they can't get out of the house, okay? As well as to augment any educational experience that we might have with current patients or with patients I've seen in the past, or those that maybe have had a flare up that might need help in, in, in ways that we've, we've treated them before, or maybe for a whole different diagnosis, okay? So a quick introduction here. So for those of you that don't know me, um, I, I am Chris Dukarski. I'm the owner of OrthoWell Physical Therapy, as well as WalkWell Fortifotics. I've been a physical therapist for the past 30 years, how time flies when you're having fun. I started WalkWell back in 97, uh, WalkWell Fortifotics, and then I expanded to include my physical therapy services in 08 in Beverly. And then we opened our second clinic in um, Newburyport um, six years ago. So I don't want to spend much more time um, than that talking about myself. I want to hear from you guys. So why don't you see now you got your chat box all revved up and ready to go here. Um, put your first name. Um, something in there and you can see I forgot to change what's going on with your shoulder as opposed to uh, uh, what should be going on with your foot. Um, so something going on with your foot, if, if you've been diagnosed with plantar fasciitis, metatarsalgia, you got a heel spur or your foot just hurts and give me some sense of what hurts with your foot and go ahead and just type that stuff in. I'm kind of watching the chat box as I'm, as I'm talking to you to get to kind of get a sense of what I'm dealing um, with today because there's a lot of things that we'll talk about that can happen uh, to the foot, okay? So um, as you're doing that, a couple more things here, just a, maybe a little, little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please, you can certainly go ahead and ask those. Tasha will be moderating um, this behind the scenes. Um, why don't you give us a little shout out, Tasha, to introduce yourself, to make sure that you can hear us. She's my co-host. Hi, everyone. Ah, uh, there she is. Awesome. So if there's any questions that she cannot field, then we will um, certainly take those questions at the end of the presentation today. Um, I definitely want to get to all of your questions. Um, so you walk away from this experience, at least um, knowing what to do next. All righty. Um, if you have not downloaded the worksheet, um, uh, let Tasha know. Um, it was in the two emails that I sent you uh, in response to you filling out your information on the landing page. And the, uh, the worksheet will pretty much mirror what we're doing in the presentation here today. It definitely enhances the educational experience and has a bunch of links and stuff on there too. Um, so you don't have to write stuff down as I'm going through um, some stuff today. So um, we do have a special bonus for you, for those that stick around to the end of the presentation today. It will be hopefully as uh, entertaining as, and as informative as possible. Um, this process will take probably about 50 minutes or so, depending on the QA at the end. Um, so I ask you to be hopefully as engaged as possible 
going forward. Um, we will talk about, I'm kind of skipping around here, but we'll talk about that bonus thing at the end of the presentation. Um, but I know there's a lot of distractions at home. Okay, I want you to, you know, like I said, be as engaged as possible. Um, I know there uh, people have dogs and kids and that Amazon Prime guy can certainly come knocking on your door. Seems like he's the, the omnipresent, uh, you know, person these days when it comes to us ordering everything through Amazon. Um, but um, yeah, and like I said, I'll be as entertaining as I possibly can. So let's see, without further ado, the introductions, let's move forward here. So let's see here. Okay, so in the chat box, who here has had foot pain or plantar fasciitis in the last 30 days? Give me a yes or a no in the chat box. Some people sometimes listen for a spouse or a family member, um, but most I would imagine are here because you have issues yourself. So, so what exactly causes foot pain? A lot of reasons for foot pain. Okay. In the foot, there are 26 bones, 33 joints, and more than a hundred muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that little structure. Okay. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in the process of, you know, 12,000 steps a day. There are those people that are doing their little Fitbit thing and getting, you know, 18, 15,000 steps a day. It's a lot, it's a lot of walking. So a lot of stuff can go wrong in the process of all those steps that you take. Okay. There are three categories of foot pain. And like I said, the presentation pretty much mirrors the worksheet. So kind of follow along, follow along the worksheet. You can fill in the blanks um, once you have something to fill in there. But the three categories of foot pain are forefoot pain, midfoot pain, and rear foot pain. And let's talk about um, each of those areas. And let's discuss maybe certain specific things that can happen in each of those areas, okay? Um, just to kind of define the areas a little bit more um, completely here, the forefoot is pretty much from the metatarsal bones, the, the bases of the metatarsal bones that um, articulate with your midfoot um, through the toes, okay? From the base going forward. The midfoot is pretty much this jumble of, of bones right here. Anywhere from your, this is your heel bone, right? Your talus is right here and your heel bones on the bottom here, okay? So the midfoot is this bunch of bones here. The rear foot pretty much comprises the talus and the calcaneus, all right? Gives us a little bit more specifics there, okay? So the most common problems in the forefoot, okay? First off, we're gonna talk a lot more about metatarsalgia later in the presentation, okay? But metatarsalgia is basically a bone bruise on the ball of your foot, okay? So you can see, uh, let me just move my chat box down here. The ball of the foot, now where his fingers are right there. Um, the metatarsal heads, every time you take a step, you're pushing off from, the, from the, those bones, right? And over time, that can cause a pain reaction, an LGA, okay? Um, and that's something that we need to try to unload by changing behavior. We'll talk more about this later on, orthotics, PT, okay? Um, neuromas. Anybody who has metatarsalgia, as I go through these, just in the chat box, put, that's what I got, okay? Or that's what my doctor told me I have, or that's what I think that I have, okay? Neuromas, as many of you might have heard, um, or read, are basically an impingement of the interdigital nerves that are in between the metatarsals, right? So as you walk, as you, for example, have a flat foot and you're rolling and pushing off, those nerves can get pinched, and that can cause numbness, tingling, pain. Synovitis is an inf inflammation of one of the joints in your foot, okay? Typically the big toe joint, the small toe, toe joints, basically where you push off can cause an inflammatory reaction. Uh, sesamoiditis, uh, there's two floating bones at the base of your big toe. Those provide like a fulcruming, a, a pulley effect that help to um, increase the biomechanical advantage of one of the muscles that um, courses um, that those sesamoid boy sesamoid bones lie within. Um, and over time, a lot of pushing and compression on those sesamoids can cause a reaction, an inflammatory reaction of the bones, okay? And all of you, of course, as you hear past us, arthritis is, you know, something that can, um, is, is going to affect us all because we're machines, right? And our joints wear out. The more that you walk, 12,000 steps a day, the more you're pushing off, the more stress it gets placed upon the, the joints and the cartilage inside the joints becomes, can start to become degraded. 
and start to wear out and start to thin. And then you start to lose the space in the joint. People, as you'll see later on in the presentation, I have a couple of videos where we show people have crossed toes. As things progress, as mechanics change, things start to cross. You start to pinch the nerves, you start to irritate the joints, and it sets this whole cascade of events in emotion that can self-perpetuate the cycle, okay? And of course, bunions, okay? Just because you have crushing toes or bunions doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have pain, but it definitely predisposes you to pain, okay? So, like I said, anybody who has any of these issues, um, enter that into the chat box where I get a sense of who's got what today. Okay, and the most common problems in the midfoot, okay, midfoot right there, um, stress fractures, right? The more you pound, running is two to three times your body weight. Um, jumping is four to six times your body weight. It's a lot of load on the midfoot. And a lot of that, that load gets imparted into those bony structures in the mid part of your foot. Arthritis, narrowing spurs, and you see those little bumps that occur on the tops of your, um, of the ball of the midfoot. That those are arthritic nodules that can, that can form. Doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have pain, but it can certainly predispose you to pain because of the changes that occur with these arthritic changes. Um, dorsal foot pain, as I said, um, could be a tendonitis, could be from the arthritic nodules, could be several things. Um, there's a tendon that courses down to the inside of your ankle and inserts pretty much in your midfoot on the navicular bone. And that's supposed to be your tibialis muscle. Some people over time, this muscle starts to fray, starts to weaken. And some people can completely rupture. Um, but initially there's a pain syndrome that gets established because of the degenerative processes that occur at that tendon. So medial arch pain, you know, a form of plantar fasciitis possibly or just muscle knots that form in the muscles from overuse um, and then joint stiffness. Um, arthritic changes over time, we lose the ability to create fluids in our joints and then stiffness can uh, result from that, okay? Causing pain as well, okay? The most common problems in the rear foot, of course, uh, the other topic of discussion later on, plantar fasciitis, we'll talk a lot more about that later. Heel spurs, um, just because you have a heel spur, doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have pain because 50% of people with heel spurs have no pain, all right? So just because you have one, your doctor says, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Smith, I uh, looked at the x-ray of a heel spur. That's, that's why you have pain. Well, not necessarily. Can it be a, a cause of pain? Yes, but doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessitate that there's going to be pain, all right? Stress fractures from pounding your heel, people that strike really hard can cause a stress fracture. Um, bursitis is a bursa on the bottom of your heel that helps to dampen the load of weight bearing. Um, bursas are fluid filled sacs and the more you pound, right, the more susceptible those bursas are to becoming an itis or bursitis, okay? Entrapment of nerves, things they get pinched through the foot, right? Uh, we'll talk about this later too, but sciatica, sometimes the first manifestation of uh, sciatica is pain on the inside of your heel. And these are things that we, you know, need to, you know, figure out in physical therapy through differential diagnosis um, is whether you have a component of sciatica. They call it a neurogenic component. The nerves actually, uh, you know, a causative factor for why you have pain in that region. Not necessarily from that spot, but someplace higher up the chain, okay? And then tarsal tunnel syndrome is a, where the nerves get pinched on the inside of your ankle from people typically that roll in and over flatten, that over pronate, that keep on stressing the nerves on the inside as well as the tendons on the inside. Okay, all right, so, so how do we come to specialize in foot pain? Okay, my, pretty much my story is I pretty much grew up in Michigan, uh, corn fed and corn bred, uh, a lot of huge uh, uh, schools, a lot of AAA schools, a lot of athletics in, uh, in Michigan. Um, so I played baseball, basketball, tennis, I ran track. Um, so a lot of injuries for me um, throughout those years and a lot of, you know, a lot of foot, foot issues. Um, you know, foot pains, um, you know, sprained ankles. And then as the years pass us, right, our body changes. And this is gonna happen to all of us, not just me. <laughs> um, but what happens on the bottom of your foot is that you lose the fat pad. You actually lose your shock absorbing ability. You know, you get fat in other places you don't wanna have it, and then you lose it in places that you need it, which is unfortunate. And my, my foot is definitely a testament to that because it's very bony and uh, can't really walk around much bare, barefooted you know, on tile or hardwood floors because it just hurts, you know, just something that is going to, 
you know, that catches up to me. And then we bought a house in West Newbury. See, Barbara is here today. Barbara's one of my neighbors. Hey, Barbara. Um, my, my professora de Espanol. Um, uh, so we bought four acres. Uh, I, I channeled the inner lumberjack and myself, and bent down felling trees, trying to create space in our backyard. And uh, one day, wasn't stretched out, went out, cold morning, went to push a felled tree and felt this burning, searing pain in my arch, right at pretty much the insertion point or the origin point of the plantar fascia. You can imagine as you're pushing off with your foot and you're bending your toes, as you do every single step you take, you're putting a certain stress on that fascia. And for me, it was a tear of the fascia. Um, it has happened, you know, several times since then. And this is, you know, we'll talk about this later on, but scar tissue forms. And then you have this, you know, waxing and waning process of, you know, things becoming symptomatic. And uh, I've done my stretches for a while. Things start to get more sore. And uh, you have to learn how to self-manage this stuff, you know, going forward. Um, so I tell my patients I've become a much more empathetic, you know, therapist because I've, I've felt and experienced a lot of the same stuff that they have, you know. Um, my shoulder, my, my back pain workshop, same thing. I've had my shoulder and my back injuries um, as well. So in the course of all this stuff for me, it's been my quest to figure out the foot, right? Um, it's been my quest to, you know, find mentors, to, you know, continuing education, to find experts in the field that have really been um, an inspiration for me and uh, have given me a lot of insight as to why or who I am today, as far as how I treat, okay? Um, and that's you know, certainly imparted to you um, when you come here to, to see us. Um, one thing that you could certainly uh, benefit from right away besides a workshop is our, or my book I've written, um, Plantar Fasciitis and Foot Pain, um, talks about a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. Um, get that for free on the website, as well as a book for shoulder pain, as well as for low back pain. Okay, uh, you can also, uh, the book links you to my YouTube channel. You can also uh, link to it from our homepage. And for each, you know, of our heavy hitters, for what we see for diagnoses, I have the best three exercises or the best three strategies for you to start um, using to treat your foot, okay, or your shoulder, or your back, okay. Our, our blog, we're always updating. We're always, you know, putting, you know, new content in there every single week we're posting something and sometimes it's on the foot, could be on the shoulder, could be on vitamins. Um, so stay tuned for that because we like to, you know, share what we learn because um, we certainly um, uh, do a lot of reading and we stay up on the evidence here in the clinic. So we share that with each other as well as with our patients. So, okay. Um, so how do you know if you're a candidate for physical therapy? Okay. Or if you need some sort of intervention beyond what you've been doing yourself? Okay. One thing that would convince you that, you know, help could be there for PT or with some other alternative strategy is if your pain is reproducible. If you can do something with a specific motion, a specific posture, a specific position, and you can recreate your pain, that means that you can reduce your pain, right? 90% um, of the people that we, we see in physical therapy have pain that's reproducible, thus reducible. There's a 10% of those patients that might need some sort of um, other medical interventions, okay? But the majority of people will get better with conservative care, right? Um, and it's really that movement assessment that we do that first day you come to see us that ascertains us reproducing it, okay? And then doing something to reduce it. So do me a favor in the chat box, um, put your, your motion or your activity that or position that hurts the worst and give me a number uh, uh, of that intensity of pain that you experience performing that activity. Zero being the worst or zero being nothing, 10 being the worst, same thing. So I can get a sense of uh, what's going on here. Okay. Um, and as you're doing that, see a couple of people here. Good. Um, the adage of, you know, going to see your doctor, right? Your doctor, you tell your doctor, doctor hurts when I do this. When I put my foot down, it hurts when I'm going to do this. The doctor says, well, Mr. Smith, don't do that, right? What the doctor should have said is you should have said, well, Mr. Smith, obviously your pain is reproducible, thereby it should be reducible. I'm going to send you to physical therapy. But unfortunately, a lot of doc doctors don't do that. Some are better than others. Um, and you you know, hopefully uh, you get that guidance from your doctor. Um, but if you don't, people go online, they find us, they find somebody else that's local or whatever, 
and they go about trying to do something intervention wise. Um, so, all right. So if it's reproducible, it's reducible. All right. So the first step in the process is a, as I mentioned before, the movement assessment, the gait evaluation, the gait analysis. We want to know what you look like statically, right? When you stand, what's your foot structure look like? What are you doing to compensate? Then from that, the gait analysis, let's see you walk, let's see what's going on. And it's a great educational um, process for you to see yourself, as you can see in the screen here, um, up on the screen here, okay? Can't tell you how many people have said, oh my God, I've never seen my feet from that angle before. That's what my doctor is talking about, or my podiatrist is talking about, when they say I, my feet roll in, right? That's over pronation, which we're gonna show videos of here shortly, right? So that is step number one, okay? It's once you understand how your foot moves, right? Then you understand why problems occur. So the more we can educate you and show you this stuff, I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to see it, okay? Um, you know, picture is worth a thousand words. So, all right. So then three um, basic categories of foot pain or foot type, foot structure, right? You got the neutral foot, okay? Then you have to both sides of the spectrum. You have the over pronating foot, other side, the supinating foot, all right? Pronation is something that should occur as we bear weight, as we walk. It's what, it's what we do to absorb um, forces, okay? To dampen uh, weight-bearing stresses, right? To adapt to uneven terrain. But if you go too far, if you overpronate, then you start to stress things. Or if you oversupinate, right? You start to stress in the other direction. You can just you know, see in here the things that you know, could be stressed just by the angle that's formed at the heel, right? So there's a neutral foot, all right? You can go back and forth through these once or twice here. There's an over pronating foot. Of course, some of my frequent flyers I've had in the past here that have done very well with orthotics. And there is a supinated foot, right? So to go back through it again here, boom. Neutral, straight up and down, nice and vertical, right? Decent arches, all right? to the pronated foot being all the way turned in, stressing the inside of your ankle, all right? And then the supinated foot, kind of like stressing the outside, the high arched foot, we describe that as, okay? The pes cavus, sometimes you might've heard the, the word cavus foot, all right? So let's look at a video here. So um, obviously the pronating foot, um, and let's maybe stop this here, so boom. Okay, so as she's about to push off, her foot is still turning in, right? Ideally, with proper mechanics, right before you go to raise your heel, well, I should say the last 25% of the gait, you should start to be re-supinating, re-turning out to the outside to prepare you for pushing off, right? Um, this is the most destructive um, position um, and structurally for the foot. The fact that you're putting load down through it you're about to push off to propel your body weight forward, and you're still in that really extreme, overly pronated position, which puts a lot of stress on the structures on the inside of your ankle. Okay, so let's go here. So let's look at this from the front, and I'm going to slow this video down. Okay, I'm going to stop it right, boom, right there. Let me go back a little bit here. Okay, so as a foot comes down, you can see just how rolled over that, that foot is. And you can just see the strain all the way through. Um, the fact that the foot is turned out, that's another compensatory reaction um, to an over pronating foot. People tend to push off the, the inside of the big toe when they have a foot that's you know, of this structure, okay? So you're stressing the forefoot because now your forefoot, instead of being uh, convex, it's concave. And what's underneath there that we talked about as a forefoot problem, your metatarsal heads, right? So as you're pushing off, you're rolling and you're shearing on the metatarsal heads, causing potentially metatarsalgia, synovitis, possible neuromas, possible crossing toes, all that fun stuff, all right? Um, and then let's run it all the way through here, okay? And the same thing, left side hits, right side definitely looks worse, all the way through and then pushing off. And you can see as the push off in the back there, the right foot, how they're kind of pushing out that inside part of the big toe, okay? 
All right, so that's the overpronating foot. All right, so when it comes down to the supinated foot, let's let's see the mechanics of this. Because you can just see, looking at that foot, um, it's a very bony foot. It doesn't necessarily have to be bony, but most people I see that are supinated look very bony, right? And when you see them walk, you can just see just how there's just nothing really going on here as far as emotion, oh, as far as emotion goes. Um, so I'm go back to here again. Shut it stuck there. Okay. So the foot's pretty much in the same position the whole time it's in contact with the treadmill. Oh, keep on doing the same dumb thing here. Sorry about that. All right. So it's a very, so supinated feet are very bad shock absorbers, very bad shock absorbing feet. Okay. There's a list contact, boom, 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 all the way down, you know, through the system. And where does that load get imparted? It gets pushed up the whole chain to your ankle, to your knee, to your hip, to your back. You need to do something to unload the system, okay? And it's been shown, there's good evidence that orthotics, custom molded orthotics can dampen the load to the system by up to 20%, okay? So people like this definitely need to unload the system, especially in combination with a good um, cushion running shoe. Sometimes people go to the Hoka's, the Hoka's have the thicker bottoms, there are a lot of, there's a lot of cushioning, a lot of stuff there to dampen the load, okay? Okay, so, so that's the three categories of foot pain. So there's essentially, I guess, three ways to address pain, not just foot pain, but you know, pain in general. Okay, let's just give you kind of a sequence of events of what happens here. Okay, so first off, somebody, you know, they push off too hard, and they get pain in their foot. They have like this, they, they tweaked something. So what do most people do, right? They might ignore it, right? That's, you know, step possible step number one. They don't do anything about it. Well, it'll be better tomorrow. I'll just go to bed and I'll be fine tomorrow. I mean, how many of you have said that? or a little ibuprofen, a little ice to calm it down, right? Things might get better for a while, but then three days later, the pain kicks in again, right? And they start getting nervous. Well, did I fracture something? Did I, did I injure something? And then you call your doctor, you know, you go and see your primary care doctor and what's a doctor do, right? Doctor listens to you, gets your history, um, and then tries to do something to help you. What they attempt to do is attempt to alter your pain by typically what? What do doctors prescribe? Medicine, right? Or tests. Right. Um, so you might have been on Advil. They might put you on naproxen, or it could be that wow, you're really in a lot of pain, Mr. Smith. Uh, we should probably get you on a steroid, prednisone, for example. Maybe some of you have taken uh, prednisone before. Uh, it can really help. And this could be like the winner, winner, chicken dinner when it comes to uh, you know taking uh, taking care of the pain. And people feel great. What do they do? They go back doing the same things as they did that brought the pain on in the first place. And then goes what happens. Pain comes back. Up. Oh, doctor call again. Go see an orthopedic surgeon. Let's see if they need to do something else, you know, surgical consult, right? So ortho goes in, well, maybe you benefit from a cortisone shot. They're trying to alter your pain again, right? Or an MRI, right? Let's see what the MRI says. And what do MRIs do, right? MRIs tell you about the structure of the foot, right? That's it. They tell you that there's something there and something there. Sometimes you're not exactly sure. It's kind of grayish here. It could be this, could be that. Um, but there's no definitive necessarily. Depends on the radiologist that's reading that. Um, and it's not until you see somebody to, that e to evaluate you with a movement assessment to determine what's functionally impairing you, right? MRIs tell you about structure. Movement assessment tells you about function, right? So then you might go online, you might find me, you might find another PT locally, whatever. And you finally start to take the next step conservatively, right? And you finally start to handle your pain to get rid of it, hopefully once and for all, instead of just trying to, you know, mitigate it with, you know, uh, medications or with injections. And then the doctor's talking about, well, it doesn't work, you know, surgery, you're trying to do something. So hopefully you're not going to ignore it. You might alter it for a while and make it feel better, which is good to calm things down. And we talk about that in therapy. Medicines are good for a while, but behavior modification is the absolute key. And doctors don't have time to talk to you about that stuff. PTs do, okay? And that's a hope to you know, finally do something about this from a, you know, a handling it standpoint, okay? So, all right. So let's go into one of the, like I said, just checking the clock there. Um, what is metatarsalgia? We've talked about it a little bit. All right, so, so, and there's that uh, crossing toe problem. You can see there's a lot of stuff happening here, that convexity in the ball of the foot, right? Putting much more undue stress on the metatarsal heads. So, and then over time, the big toe 
the little toe, the second toe starts to cross over that big toe because of all these compensatory reactions. You're pushing off, you're pushing off the inside of your big toe, and it's just a matter of time before the toes start to cross over each other, right? So anatomy again, we've talked about this before, but those are the metatarsal heads, the sesamoid bones we talked about right down through there. Um, yep, and that's essentially like we talked about. It's, it's a bony bruise is the way this starts. And it can form eventually a stress reaction, which is a precursor to a stress fracture, which is what we don't want to have happen. So right back to that, you know, gait analysis again, you can see how in this person, you can see how they're almost even striking the ball of their foot first when they walk, right? Which puts more undue stress. And this of course is a case too with four foot strikers that are runners. Sprinters tend to be four foot strikers. If you're a four foot striker and a distance runner, you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> you're definitely predisposing yourself to all kinds of issues in the balls of your feet. So that's something we talk about in, in our run well, um, you know, running performance training program, this idea of looking at people and, and trying to change their behavior, trying to change their cadence. We're trying to change how they strike, um, knowing that there's good evidence that guides us in these directions for how to change people's behavior, right? So a little video here I'm gonna share with you um, that just talks about um, the way I make orthotics for metatarsalgia, just to kind of put this all into a little bit more of a, a better package for you. So let's listen to this. Oh. Oh, on. The metatarsal bones. Uh, there's basically it's the head, you have the neck of the metatarsal, mm -hmm. and you have the head of the metatarsal. Okay. Underneath on the bottom, of course, on the, on the first metatarsal, you have these sesamoids here, but underneath the sesamoids are, is basically the head of the metatarsal. You can see it better here in the second, third, fourth, and fifth, this little rounded section here. Okay. So as you're walking, if you lose your fat pad through here, as you get older, that's a physiological process that occurs. Um, you lose your fat pad, you lose your shock absorption. Okay. Or it's just some people that over, um, that are just busy and they're on their feet a lot and they're putting a lot of stresses wearing maybe bad shoes, walking barefoot, and they create a pain syndrome. Okay. So metatarsalgia uh, being a, 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 an algia, um, a pain syndrome of the metatarsal head. So with orthotics, what we're attempting to do is we're attempting to make the patient bear weight in other places to off weight bear on the metatarsal. So say, for example, you have pain underneath the second metatarsal head right here. Same idea. You want to hug the orthotic up against here to make them bear weight here, especially if they're an overpronator and they're rocking down like this. And I want to try to hold that up so this doesn't drop. If this drops, you can see just by looking at the bottom of the foot how much more load it places. I'm pushing on this, and this is pushing down even more. Okay, As it pushes down more, the forefoot tends to spread. And, of course, that can cause other issues you know, later on. Um, so, so I'm trying to hold here. I'm trying to make them bear more weight here and off weight there as much as I can over here. So we attempt to do, you know, uh, an orthotic that is custom ordered, of course, to the foot, and then a tarsal pad here, and then I'll put an extension over here to make them bear weight here, make them bear weight here, right behind that, and then make them bear weight here. So as you can see, with your orthotic, okay, and actually this is a, goes well with the, with the model here, okay? Bear weight up against there, and of course, this is in a nice motion control shoe. If they have an overpronated foot, no, it's always it's very relative to what kind of foot we're dealing with here. Bear weight here, then you roll this over, and you can see what I did there. I'm making them bear weight right behind the second metatarsal head and the third one. This metal pad goes from number two to you know maybe maybe to number four here, and then a post out over here. All right, so. I'm sure that in the crowd today, I've made orthotics for somebody for metatarsalgia. Um, so if anybody here um, has metatarsalgia, same sort of thing. Give me a shout out in the text chat box there so I kind of know who's got what here. So, so like I said, that's one of the most prevalent problems that we see in the foot, metatarsalgia. Um, so let's move on to the next one, of course, as we alluded to earlier, plantar fasciitis. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online about planters for sure. A lot of guys doing their uh, little exercise videos and you know the, the little gimmick to make your foot feel better. And hey, you don't know until you do it. Honestly, there's no cure-all when it comes to the stuff. You know, Sometimes you might benefit from a little fancy brace or uh, you know, a little different stretch or whatever. You just like I said, you just don't know until you do it. 
Okay. So, so what is plantar fasciitis? And I'm sure a lot of you have looked this up or have heard about it, but essentially it's a tearing. Like when I describe my pushing off thing, I tore my fascia right there. I could feel that searing, burning pain at that attachment site. And that sets that whole cascade of events in emotion, right? It tears inflammation. Your body tries to heal it, right? And then scar tissue forms over time. And depending on how that scar tissue forms determines whether you have chronic issues or whether you don't, whether something's moving properly again or whether it doesn't. Right. So, and, and people that have recalcitrant, you know, longstanding chronic, you know, heel pain are usually those people where there's something scarred that's not moving right. It's what we call non-functional scar. And this next video I talk about, we'll um, get into that a little bit more. So let's maybe listen to that here. Plantar as well. as a presentation, we're trying to unload the fascia. We're trying to do something biomechanically to prevent that fascia from stretching. And what that essentially means is that if you're walking and you're doing this, the fascia is right down through here. The fascia goes from the inside part of your heel and it goes in five little slips right to each toe. It's like this broad band of connective tissue on the bottom of your foot. Um, the more you walk, the more you strain it, the more you don't um, control your biomechanics, the more likely it is that this fascia can tear. And that's what starts the itis and the uh, scar tissue, you know, forms to, um, to, to, to heal um, the injured tissue, depending on how the scar tissue um, forms and heals, determines whether it's a functional scar or a non-functional scar. And that brings in the whole osis debate, being a degenerative problem. Osis is degeneration of tissue. So, um, but regardless of that, whether it's an itis or an osis, we still treat it the same way with the thorax. We're trying to take some of the strain off the fascia. So if you're walking and this is bowing down, you can see I'm stressing that fascia. The fascia is connected from here down to there. So I'm making it bow. So I need something that's going to hold it up over here. Okay, that's number one. Number two, from behind, we can actually you know, make a post to try to rotate that heel out to the side to, in a sense, do the same thing. The research is a kind of a little bit vague, um, not, not too specific, whether this actually does do a lot for the fascia or whether it doesn't. Um, but in a lot of cases, we attempt it. It does well for people. Some people do just a neutral heel where it's nice and flat, um, and we get, you know, just as good a result. Okay. What research does tell us, and this is counterintuitive to some things that some podiatrists do and some therapists do, is that we post the orthotic, meaning we keep the, the orthotic thicker on the outside, and then we sky it and wean it down so it's thinner towards the big toe. All right. So this idea of itis versus osis. Uh, these days, osis was probably 10 years ago. Now we're into the whole plantar fasciopathy or rotator cuff tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, right? This idea that there's something pathological um, with the tendon. There's something that's gone awry. This whole thing about non-functional scar. And in a lot of people, you can feel how thickened this tissue is. And that thickening of tissue can be that non-functional scar. You've got to try to restore some normalcy and some patency to that, you know, that tendon, to that, to that tissue. Because sometimes things are just stuck. They're hard. It's rigid. It's not moving um, like it like it should be. Because it needs to move as your tendon is, as your tissue is moving. Um, every time you push off, if you're causing a stress to that tissue that's now now not very strong, right? It's deconditioned. It can't tolerate the load you place upon it. What's going to happen? Chronic pain, right? And then they've done tissue samples on these tendinopathy and plantar fasciopathies, and they found no evidence of inflammation in chronic cases, right? But when you've gone to see your doctor after six months of pain, what's your doctor prescribe? An anti-inflammatory, right? And that's not what you need. You need to recondition that tissue. That means heat. It means getting in there and massaging it, trying to break it up, trying to reignite the inflammatory process to jumpstart the healing cascade again. And then we use needles sometimes, we're both, um, Ivan and I are trained in dry needling here, and that can help to speed up the process as well, okay? So what do orthotics do for this? Let me show you. Going on the orthotic, we're trying to hug that um, orthotic up to the, the mid part of the foot to the navicular, so the navicular bone doesn't drop, okay? With this one, we actually did angle it about five degrees in the back, for somebody who's over pronated, who's, who's flat footed. And then what we do in the front, this is gonna be a little bit tougher to see, okay? Is that we keep this lower relative to this over here. I don't know if you can see that on the bottom here, but if I flip this over, you can see what I've done here. Is that really, I've, I've kept it thick over here and I've skived it and thinned it down through here. 
Okay. So if you really think about this from a, a biomechanical standpoint, um, I guess really almost a, almost a common sense standpoint, if you if you pick this side up, pick this side up, and let the, the let the first metatarsal go down, you're actually it's almost like you're slackening the tissue. Okay. The whole idea of, of this kind of dropping the big toe drop beneath the level of the of the platform that I'm on here, it actually in a sense brings this metatarsal head closer to the heel. All right. So yeah, so like I said, a lot of evidence based uh, you know you know, stuff that goes into fabricating our orthotics. I mean, there's a good reason for all that we do. Um, and we share that with you, you know, when we're making the orthotics. So if you are interested, that is. So, okay. So of those in the crowd today, who thinks that they have plantar fasciitis uh, definitively or whether you think you have it or, or what, or maybe you've been treated for it already and you haven't got better. That's a huge thing um, for the types of patients we see in our clinic is those people that haven't gotten better elsewhere. But one of those things too, don't think that you haven't gotten, um, that you've gotten it all, right? Um, if there's still pain, right? You could be somebody in that 10% who might need surgery. Yes. But in a lot of cases, we find that you just haven't been comprehensively treated. Okay. So, and like I said, um, uh, check out the worksheet, make sure you're filling things in as you go along. Any questions, you can certainly, you know, send a question to Tasha as we go through this or save it to the end for our Q and A, okay? One thing that can certainly help uh, planters is uh, taping, okay? This is a, uh, an example of that. We've gotten a lot of great results using uh, taping to try to take the load off the fascia. It's a great way uh, to see if people would benefit from foot orthotics, right? And sometimes we do the taping in combination with orthotics when people are really sore. Chris, you got a big day tomorrow. Would you mind taping me in combination with your orthotics? I don't want to have the pain come back because um, it'll distract me from my presentation. So um, these are things that we can certainly do to help speed up the process. And it's another way of making people change their behavior. And you got your tape, you got your orthotics, and maybe you should be on a crutch as well. All this stuff. So you're not causing that constant pain that poking the bear each and every step you take, right? Taking a hammer to that tissue, all right? And we talked about sciatica. Okay, there's certain tests that we can do to ascertain whether that, that heel pain that you have, the inside of your heel, is it sciatic or not? And if you go to my YouTube channel, um, that talks about low back pain and sciatica, uh, there's a test there that you can do yourself uh, to ascertain whether you um, have sciatica or not. Something that if you perform the test and you cause your heel pain as you're sitting, they call it the slump test, and you slump forward and you uh, bend that ankle up and you cause, oh my God, that's my heel pain, right? That's not planters, right? Uh, could be that you have both. You could have a component of each, but it's not, it's very atypical, doesn't happen, that that would cause pain with just planters, okay? So, okay. So are you ready to get serious as far as taking the next step to make you better, okay? So here's what successful treatment looks like, all right? So first off in primary, uh, we've talked about the movement assessment, the gait analysis, the gait evaluation. That's where the process begins. We need to identify what the problem is, right? And then from that, educate you so you know what's going on with your foot. So you know how to self-manage, you know how to avoid things that are poking the bear and causing the pain, right? Because I can't tell you, I mean, usually me getting pulled in on a, on a case, uh, another therapist of mine is having a hard time with, it's right back to the basics. What are you doing at home? Are you compliant? Did you do this? Did you do that? Should you do less? Maybe you keep on pushing through pain, hoping, maybe ignoring a little bit, maybe you're in denial a little bit. Okay, these are things you definitely want to um, think about. All right. Then next thing from that is hands-on therapy. As many of you know, um, those of you that have um, seen us before for either other problems or for your, for your foot in the past, we do a lot of manual therapy, a lot of hands-on therapy, grasping, cupping, um, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, active release technique, a lot of just getting in there and kind of frictioning, massaging, you know, um, different parts uh, that, are, that are symptomatic. You're trying to reignite the inflammation in there in a sense. When you get really deep, now, a lot of therapists in other clinics don't do a lot of hands-on care because they don't believe that there's evidence to it. Well, hate to tell you, there's a lot of great evidence to the fact that manual therapy causes a great effect, great physiological effect on your circulation, 
on your nervous system. That's been demonstrated clinically, right? Um, it's just, uh, they're looking for the fact that this particular intervention will take away plantar fasciitis. No, it's the combination of things. And after 30 years of doing hands-on care in combination with everything else, this is what I found works the best. And this is what I talk about in the, the book that I've written on, on foot pain. And then of course, the, you know, the, the, uh, gold level evidence for exercise, right? For taking pain away, especially for low back pain, right? Exercise certainly is the key, but it's that in combination with the other things. And what's the best exercise is for planters, right? There's no definitive. <clears throat> like I said, there's a lot of guys out there with their little protocol, a little regimen for, you know, treating plantar fasciitis. Um, and I've got a DVD you can buy that I put together that takes you through this, you know, step-by-step. -step. You got a you know, an aunt or a friend in, in Oregon, uh, wherever that wants to, you know, kind of learn from us and kind of like we hear today, you can refer them to Chris's DVD on his website. That's on my, my list of, um, uh, you know, programs and um, special offerings um, on the website. Okay. Then of course we talked about for orthotics. There's a lot of great evidence to orthotics. We are up on the evidence for all the latest and greatest of what's being uh, done out there. And I'm not going to um, talk about that much more. I think we have as well or enough already. Um, what we do have that other clinics don't is a class for a laser. Okay. We have a partnership with light force lasers. Um, these lasers are used in the NHL, um, used in the um, uh, major league football um, and major league uh, baseball. Um, Division one um, college teams use laser um, because they know it gets their athletes better faster. When you're paying somebody 25 million bucks, right? And you got, you know, Mahomes uh, getting ready for Super Bowl this weekend um, with his uh, little turf toe thing. You can bet your behind he's getting laser, right? Because we know that laser gets these guys better faster and you need to have them out there in the field performing so your team has the best chance to win, right? They actually started using lasers uh, back um, in the equine. Uh, the horse uh, business. We have a couple horses um, and I uh, haven't used it on our horses yet. Um, we use it on our dog for an ACL uh, problem uh, probably five, six years ago. Um, so it's been, that's where it started. The FDA approved lasers for humans back in 08. And um, now they're, they've gone from class one, now they're at class four, right? And that's what we have in the clinic. And what laser does is laser stimulates chemical reactions in the cells to jumpstart healing, to decrease pain, to decrease inflammation. So it gets people better faster, right? So I have a whole web page where I talk about this on the website. You could, you know, go in there, read the whole thing, got a whole list of um, uh, references, citations down below that talk about the evidence and what's been done for this, all right? So, so that's what successful treatment looks like, all right? So then on to, so what do you do next, right? So just to kind of recap here, right? So essentially you, you, probably have foot pain. You clicked on our ad, you came to see us, you shared you know, with us some issues that you've had. I've given you my whole spiel, right? So I'm guess, guessing that you have pain and you wanna do something about it, right? You don't wanna ignore it anymore. You don't wanna alter it. You wanna finally handle it once and for all and get rid of it once and for all. So here's what I'm recommending, all right? So you can go to orthoLPT.com forward slash schedule, right? And you can make sure when you do that, don't put it into Google search, put it into the taskbar, the URL bar on the top, and that'll take you to my landing page and they can enter your info. And Michelle will get back to you ASAP. She is actually on call tonight in case anybody is excited, enthusiastic, and doesn't want to wait. Um, she's um, um, at 978-522-4199 for the next probably you know 40 minutes or so. Um, give her a buzz or call tomorrow, whatever. Um, and whether we do something in person or something you know telehealth-wise, it's really up to you, right? It's up to your comfort level, okay? Um, and as you're maybe checking out the, the URL, you can see what the landing page looks like, enter your info. Let's just talk a little bit more about what to expect. Um, I would imagine most of you have been in PT before. If you haven't, you're, if we haven't seen you before, you might have been someplace else. But essentially the first day, right? What do you do the first day? It's, a, it's, it's the evaluation. It's the movement assessment. You want to get a good sense of what's going on with your foot, right? It's the idea of taking you through the process. There's a lot of you know, uh, clues in the subjective part, the questions we ask you that tell us what could potentially be going on with you. We're pretty much 90% sure by the time we're done talking to you, what's going on with your foot. That's why telehealth can be you know, effective. Of course, it's not as good as doing one-on-one because -on -one, you're right in front of us, we can do whatever one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, but we certainly can get a good sense of that. So telehealth, telehealth is certainly still an option, right? So then what's the next thing we do? There's a lot of um, uh, testing that we do. There's a lot of simple tests that we can perform to ascertain what's going on, like that slump test or sciatica, right? Um, different tests that elicit pain that help to um, reproduce your pain and then things we can follow that help to reduce your pain, okay? Um, by the time we're done, the last thing that we do is we sit you down and we um, hold your hand and we give you our detailed wellness plan of care is what we call it. Where we um, give you the whole, from, this, from start to finish, what's going on with your foot, okay? Uh, what, what do we need to do going forward? What are the, the things that we recommend from an intervention standpoint, manual therapy, laser, orthotics to get you better faster? So by the time you walk out, you have a detailed plan of what um, we can do to help you. And like I said, it's really up to you to determine you know, what direction you want to go with this, whether it be telehealth, whether it be in person. But, you know, like I said, orthowellpt.com uh, for its last schedule, or you can call the number right there. This is the landing page you can you know, fill out when you go to that, um, uh, to that URL and fill out your info right there. And that's pretty much the, the crux of the presentation here. And I've got, because I've done this several times before, we have some um, frequently asked questions that seem to come up um, during these, these workshops. Is PT covered by insurance? Yeah, most often times it is, right? And Tasha, you can jump on um, just so we can field any other questions that may have been asked in the process of the workshop here. Um, uh, yeah, most often we take all the major payers except for Mass Health. Um, uh, so yes, uh, besides a copay, insurance should cover your PT. Do you need a referral? Of course, that is dictated by your insurance. Some payers do, some payers don't. Like a PPO, you can just do whatever you want to do. You don't need a referral. You can just you know call and schedule and come right on in. Can foot pain happen due to old age? Well, we've talked about that a bit. Just because you have arthritic changes does not necessarily mean that you're going to have pain. You can have these changes. These changes occur slowly over time. So your body slowly adapts to them over time, right? But can they? Yeah, sure. It does predispose you because now things are more narrow. So if you plant and twist on the tennis court, go a little bit too far and a little bit too aggressive, aggressive because now you're playing singles and you should be playing doubles, you are predisposed to something getting pinched and something getting irritated, right? Um, that's the next uh, thing, arthritis, bursitis, bone spurs, not necessarily, but yes, they can, right? Can weakness cause foot pain? Certainly, right? And this is the whole thing about, um, you know, people compensating someplace up the chain. You know, we even talk to our patients who that are really flat footed as you're rolling in and pushing off, right? What are other muscles you can use to take some of the stress off of your foot, right? Your glutes, your hamstrings, your hip abductors, the muscles that raise your leg out to the side. Um, all those are very important. If the muscles in your ankle or your foot are really weakened, could that cause an arch to drop more? Yeah, theoretically it could. Right. Um, this is why we should start, you know, kids that have fat feet on programs. And I have this uh, program called my four points to fitness program um, through our program link on the on the website um, where it talks about, you know, how your kids could benefit. All right. And this is something that if you start earlier and kids are still growing and you provide good structural control and you work on strengthening exercises, theoretically, you should create a better structurally sound system going forward. Why I say theoretical is that no one's ever done a longitudinal study on this stuff, right? Most doctors don't prescribe PT for kids for flat footedness, right? They say, if it's not a problem, it doesn't hurt, don't worry about it. Well, I see the, the end result of all these years of people not doing something about it. So if you can start your kids earlier than later, even better for them, right? And will surgery cure my foot pain? Not necessarily. Sometimes you go through the whole rigmarole, you, you sign up for it, and then afterwards, you're like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done it man, I really should have, you know, um, done my conservative care. But by the time you're done with what we do here at OrthoWell, you're convinced that as much um, that could be done to resolve your symptoms has been done, right? Because we, right from start to finish, if it's not working, you're not better in a couple of visits, right? We're not getting you better, not that you'd be cured in a couple of visits. Some people are, not everybody. Um, but if we're not moving in the right direction and you're, you're stagnant, right? You're not moving, we're doing something wrong or you're not compliant with what we've told you to do. You're not changing your behavior. And that's that process, that paradigm we go through going forward to guide you 
in the process. So, and anything for me, Tosh? Anything come up? So I got a good question in the chat. So I have supination for which your orthotics have really helped, even though they're in my tennis shoes, which I haven't worn recently. Does that mean that the orthotics have developed muscle memory to neutralize my supination? So, so essentially, you're... can orthotics help even if you don't wear them all the time? Do you have yeah, to wear is... them forever? Yeah. Is there like a carryover effect? Yes. In other words, yes. Um, has there ever been a longitudinal study done on this? No, no. It's just the same thing. It's back to theoretical stuff, right? So we know for sure when it comes to the evidence that by placing something, and I'm going to say this really generally, something different underneath your foot, we get a neurological reaction up the chain. Whether well, it's something soft, something hard, something arched, something custom, something prefab, there's no evidence that says that one thing definitively will cause an effect on your biomechanics, right? Because sometimes a prefab works just as good as a custom, okay? And this is why we've gotten away from the, the um, assessment or the, the research um, we call the kinematics, the motions of the foot. And a lot of the research has gone towards the kinetics, the forces that act upon uh, this, the system, right? So orthotics or something softer underneath, un, underneath the foot, how does it change the impact signals to the whole system? I guess over time, if you're training the system to have a less sensitive neurologic response, right? By having that orthotic against your foot, playing tennis, tennis, planting, twisting, all that other crazy stuff you do, jumping, you know, whatever, um, you're taking some strain off the system. So you're cradling the system, right? Decreasing the load, decreasing the neurologic sensitivity. So maybe you wouldn't need orthotics outside of your sporting activity. This depends on the person, right? And that's all depends on the person. I tell my patients too, well, instead of making the dress, you know, shoe orthotic, maybe just try the sport one first, see what that does. Maybe that'll calm your symptoms down. So now you can get back wearing your flats, your Birkenstocks, your clogs, whatever, and not have symptoms. And then you figure out, okay, was there a training effect and a calming down effect wearing my motion control shoes with my orthotics so I won't need them for my other shoes. You just don't know until you go through the process, right? And that same thing in PT, it's all trial and error, right? You just gotta figure out a, 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 an appropriate intervention, see what the effect is, and then decide based upon that. Anything else? Okay, so another question I get a lot is, because the gyms are closed right now, a lot of people have started walking. Um, is there something else people can do to stay active that doesn't cause such damage to their feet or should they mm -hmm. kind of cut back? What's the best bet going forward with that? Yeah. Walking causes foot pain, but they don't have anything else to do. Yeah, so good question. You know, this whole idea of COVID and people can't go to gyms, right? So what are my options? I don't have any machines at home, right? What can I do? Easiest thing is to put your shoes on and go for a walk. Or of course our runners want to put their shoes on and just go, whether it be 18 inches of snow on the ground or what, it's amazing. I just, it still boggles my mind. I think these guys are out there running um, after a big snowstorm or something. Uh, but when you're addicted, you're addicted, right? Um, so what could you do that's not as load bearing on the system as walking, right? If you don't have access to other things, it makes it really difficult, right? But the obvious question, obvious answer to the question is stationary bike, swimming, right? Um, they ran, they, they, they sold out, I, I think of all bikes, initial COVID, Pelotons are like, you know, two months out for getting those delivered. Um, so people went crazy with that stuff. Um, but when things are back to normal, um, if you have a bike, you know, a nicer day, it's cool out, you could still ride your bike, right? There's another, another option at least, or you can get a trainer where you can put your bike on a roller and put in your, your garage or in your house, whatever. Um, that's, that's another option there. Um, but cross training is the key. Right? Cross training is a key, really, it should be for all of us as the years pass us, right? Uh, the more you can you know, change the impact forces to the system, the less abrasive weight bearing forces are going to be, right? If you run seven miles every single day, that's an abrasive event every single day. You, know, you don't have enough recovery time to make up for what you did the day before. So, so yes, you bike one day, and, and that's why triathletes are usually better off with their bodies in the long haul than our runners, just pure runners, because triathletes will 
they'll run one day, then they'll bike and then they'll swim. And you have this different mix of things every single uh, week. Um, but of course, when it comes down to the volume, triathletes are very addicted to what they do. Um, and every triathlete will tell you they're very addicted to their training and they're addicted to, you know, the, the next, the next big goal for them. Right. So if you're doing Ironman and you're doing a marathon, hundred miles and two mile swim, that's a lot of load on the body. And it's a lot of training to get there. Okay. So it's all within reason going forward. So I'd say, yes, if you can get onto a bike, get off your feet. If it is sore, if you're pushing through pain, it's, it's the definition of insanity. It is not going to get better if you do the same thing that keeps on irritating you. Okay. One more question. So Peggy asks, I got new orthotics from you a couple months ago and I'm still having some metatarsal pain. What do you suggest the next step is? Well, first step, hello, Peggy. It's a pleasure that you joined us today, um, is to see if the orthotic could benefit from more dispersion, right? So if, and we incorporated a metatarsal pad in your orthotic, do you need more? Um, sometimes I can create like a little horseshoe sort of pad. So if the second metatarsal is like right here, right? And you create a horseshoe, sometimes that horseshoe will make you load on the set, on the first, on the fifth. I got the metatarsal um, pad just um, before the second metatarsal, for example. And then we're loading the arch, right? All that stuff in combination might take even more pressure off the system. Sometimes you can add more cork in the arch to make you load more on the arch to take more pressure off the ball of your foot, right? Um, then shoes, of course, maybe I would imagine you probably had, you know, I can't remember if you had bought new shoes and you came in, but typically people will take their orthotics and go and buy new shoes just to make sure they've kind of covered all their bases. Um, but those are the best strategies and that's treating it from a structural standpoint, right? Sometimes that's all you can do from a structural standpoint, right? Because every time you step, it's not like, you're walking on a cloud. It's not like you're not putting any pressure on the, met on the metatarsal heads. You're still pushing off, right? So in that vein, what's something else we can do to prevent the bend? You can put a plate underneath your orthotic. We, we make these, these rigid four foot plates that go underneath the orthotic that, that, um, that prevent you from bending at the flex point of your foot. And that's where the big toe bends, you know, where the bunion forms, right? That's the flex point. So you can prevent that. Now you're rolling off instead of bending off. That's why Hoka's and uh, oh, what's the other one? I forgot the name of the other um, shoe that was very similar to that. It's got the it's like got, got the rocker bottom to it, right? So it's kind of the rolling off, you know, sort of effect as well. So it helps to transition the weight more quickly from the heel to toe off. And some shoes are even pretty stiff. Some hiking shoes are pretty stiff in the, at the flex point. So now you're rolling off instead of bending off. And you put the plate in there too. It even enhances it, you know, triple full. The orthotic, the good shoe, the, the plate, and that's as much as you can do. And then it's back to behavior. If all the structural stuff, wow, man, I'm doing as much as you, you said, Chris, and I'm still in pain. Well, maybe you need to start doing some soft tissue stuff some laser to it, some needling possibly, just to kind of excite the circulation to um, do something to kind of get the, the inflammatory process restarted to try to jumpstart healing in there, right? And then if that all doesn't do it, it's the same thing in the process of, of us educating you, getting off your foot, right? Avoiding that push off. You, you, instead of pushing off, you're taking a shorter step. You're not trying to put as much load on it as you're walking. You're intentionally sometimes limping a little bit. We can show you the proper way to do that. If that doesn't work, then you start, you know, you get, you put people on a crutch to simply take more pressure off the foot. These are all things that are, they're temporary. My tell my runners, it's a temporary change in the training schedule because they freak out when I say you need to stop running. Okay. Just temporarily, you know, take a deep breath, you know, cause these guys, you know, tend to tend to freak out. And, and some of you might as well. I can't do that. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta function. I gotta do this. Well, well, Peggy, if you don't make these changes, I would say, then it's the definition of insanity and you're probably not gonna get better very quickly. It might take you a lot longer, but it might get worse in the process or you're gonna get wicked frustrated in the process because you're not doing the stuff that we talked about. Make sense? Long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Sure. How long do orthotics generally last? Uh, well, Two to three years is what I tell people on average. Depends on what I make. I make harder stuff. The, 
semi-flexible stuff, the, the really dense, you know, foams, and then I make the really softer stuff. The softer stuff will wear out sooner, right? So my runners come back every year and two months because, you know, that's when they want more cushioning, right? They're pounding, they know their feet, that is their equipment, and they know when they need something better. I can always recover the softer orthotics with this sponge material to kind of bring back the softness factor again. Uh, but yeah, some people, it wears out sooner than others. And sometimes I'm a victim of the system too, because I order, you know, foams, they're all made in China now, and they're all based on dew point and humidity. Sometimes they thin down quicker than others, because sometimes people come in after five years, I'm like, holy moly, this without it looks great. There's minimal wear on it. And it's like, and then some people come back every couple of months. I'm like, God, this is crazy how much it's, it's, it's starting to, you know, flatten down. And that's just the chemistry of it all. And I, and believe me, it's been frustrating for me. And there are some things I've been putting together as of late that might, you know, change the, the paradigm a little bit for how I'm, you know, doing some orthotics in a little bit of a different way. So that stuff doesn't happen. But if it does happen, then we can always, like I said, it's another step in the process. I don't do it right away because it adds more stuff to the orthotic. And then sometimes it's too thick. But if after a couple months or a year, two years, you know, you see it's really starting to wear down, maybe a hole is going to form. I can put this nice spongy top cover on it that'll increase the longevity, the lifetime of the orthotic, as well as increase the softness factor again. So, yep. One more question, actually from a former patient of ours who moved to warmer weather. He has orthotics from us and he did PT with us up yep. until the point where he moved, but he's still having pain. Is there something he should do um, on his end going forward? Yeah, well, it's tough when you're not, you're not local, but uh, let's see, I think that I'm not sure the telehealth thing we could do. Uh, I think across state lines initially, I'm not sure if they, if they changed it now, you know, we've gotten away from a lot of the, the telehealth. We'd always have a phone call as well. We'd always chat and see what's going on or do a, you know, quick little chat on via zoom or something like that. And you can always do that for, yeah, I can have Ivan give him a, shoot him an email or something too. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Connect that um, way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the beauty of, 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 of being so connected. Digi digitally these days that we can you know, do stuff like that um, for sure. And then some people, I can't make orthotics, you know, for you without your foot. I mold everything to your foot. Sometimes that's people's thing. Can you just send me another pair, Chris, from your cast that you took? No, we don't do the cast here. I used to do casts, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and sometimes they put those into the computer and they can, you know, digitize that and you call them back up and they, you know, they resend. But every time I make them, I'm remolding it to your foot. So if there's any changes in your foot, I'll capture that. Um, but I need to have your foot, unless, of course, you can send your feet to me, which would be a trick in and of itself. That's for sure. All right. That's all we've got for questions. All right. Cool. Well, that's, um, that is it. So everybody, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your attendance today. Um, looking forward to helping you guys out to get rid of your pain once and for all. Give us a buzz. Like I said, the number 978-522-4199 or the orthowell PT forward slash schedule and enter some info there. And hopefully um, we'll see y'all. Take care. Best in health. See ya.